Hey there, folks. This is Mitch Firestone with Precision Trading Labs in New York City. It is March 14th, one day before the Ides of March, which, of course, is the 15th, 2024. And this is the uh, Thursday uh, live trading session. Um, today, we're going to actually start to uh, kind of uh, sort of change a little, change up the format a little here, and uh, we'll certainly talk about supply and demand and then trading techniques and everything. But actually, each week we're also going to in introduce a, a trading theme into this. Um, and of course, as always, if you have any symbols or any charts you want to share, you're welcome to do so. But uh, today we're going to kind of focus um, on um, on crypto. Um, recently, I guess about two months back. Uh, 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 ETFs were actually approved to uh, actually uh, hold spot crypto uh, before, and we'll, we'll go into the various types of ETFs, exchange traded funds that are associated with Bitcoin. Um, but um, it's it's kind of raised a new opportunity, and that that arose about two months ago. So everyone's kind of excited about that, and so we figured we would talk about uh, how you can actually trade actual crypto now without actually having to get into the whole deal of actually buying coin, you know, actually buying coins or dealing with the wallets and all the complications of crypto. Uh, you can just trade crypto in the same manner that you trade uh, any ETF. So you want to trade GLD for gold or USO for oil. Uh, it's just like trading a stock. And now it's now literally it's the same exact thing uh, for crypto. Um, so we're going to go into all that. Uh, before I do that, uh, the usual disclaimer, um, Precision Trading Labs, we are not uh, financial advisors nor money managers. Um, everything that we present is for educational and informational purposes only. And of course, in the case of our subscribers, everything we're doing is targeting at tar targeted at uh, helping our uh, subscribers to become competent, confident traders. Um, so that's the deal. So um, what I'm just going to do is let me introduce the concept of what goes on in terms of trading crypto, and then we'll actually sort of see how that would, how we can actually approach that uh, in the charts. Um, so I've actually built a uh, workspace that's devoted to, uh, to Bitcoin. Um, and so here it is. And the key, to what I want to show you here is this, which is, of course, the, the watch list. So what are we looking at here? Um, what we're looking at here is um, basically two different flavors of exchange traded funds. Okay, so there's there's a category up here and a category down here. So what we're looking at here on the top one, these are all the ones that are now approved to um, actually hold spot. Uh, spot uh, spot Bitcoin. Um, and, and then in fact, there's also actually a couple of the ones that actually hold other um, other coins as well. I think there's an Ethereum one um, that's hold spot Ethereum. And so these are very analogous to, let's say, and I'm going to use the I'm going to use the GLD uh, ETF as as um, as a comparison. Um, GLD, when you're trading that, the, um, the, the whoever runs the GLD um, um, ETF, they actually own gold. I mean, physical gold. OK. And so these guys actually own physical, if you call it physical Bitcoin. OK. They actually own coins. OK. And so that's what we mean when we say spot Bitcoin ETFs. They actually own coin. OK. Then there's the ones below here. And it says Bitcoin strategy ETFs. So what does that mean? These are all the ones that existed before. And in fact, some of these up here also existed before. But then once the uh, the approval came about, then I think they sort of changed up their mission. Because I know the GBTC, uh, that's been around for a while, um, the grayscale one. Um, but now they're considered to be a spot Bitcoin ETF. So the ones that are strategy ETFs, they essentially we can think of uh, of think of them as um, essentially having indirect exposure to Bitcoin. And so what these guys did or do, do I should say is they own Bitcoin futures. Okay, so they don't own physical Bitcoin, but they own fit. Bitcoin futures, which are essentially we can think of as a derivative of Bitcoin. Okay, so you, effectively you have indirect 
indirect exposure. Okay. And then there's, and then there's a couple of other things where they, they actually, in fact, some of them, I think actually have shares of, of the actual companies uh, that actually do Bitcoin mining. So again, it's an indirect, it's an indirect exposure. Okay. So the ones up here have the direct exposure. These again are the indirect exposure because they own futures as well as other things that are related to Bitcoin, but they don't, don't actually own Bitcoin which of course the ones up here, they do, okay? So these are the ones that mostly we're gonna focus on trading. And then down here, BITO, that's been around for a long time. Uh, we, can, we can certainly trade that. Uh, but other than that, we're gonna pretty much focus on trading these up here. So now if we look at these and you go, okay, well, there's five or 10 of them up here. Well, which ones should we trade or does it make a difference? Well, the answer is, yeah, I guess it, it kind of does. It, does make a difference. So what we have here, if you look at this column here, it says volume average, okay? And then there's a volume average, and then there's, the, there's, the, and then there's today's volume, okay? So we can see the ones up here, these are trading a whole lot of shares, okay? You can see this IBIT, uh, it, it's averaged 50 million shares uh, per day. And I think I think I have this thing set up for the last, uh, I think, uh, I can't remember. I think I have this set up for the last 50 days or, or 22 days, one or the other. 22 is actually how many trading days there are in the average month. I can't remember what I have this set up for. But the bottom line is um, this thing has been averaging 50 million shares for at least the last 22 trading days. Okay. And then you can see today it actually put up basically twice as many. Okay. So the ones that are really highly liquid, okay, I would be a fan of trading. And so the ones that are really highly liquid, certainly the ones that are up here, anywhere from the 3 billion up to the 50 million. And then you can see right here, here's 885 and 915,000. These are close to a million, okay? So um, these, are all the, these are all the ones that are worth trading. Now, having said that, because these guys own spot Bitcoin, you may as well just only trade one of them because all the charts, are effectively identical, okay? And I, and, I, and I do mean identical, okay? So right here, if I just flip back here for a second. So what I'm gonna do here is, I'm gonna, just gonna flip through uh, a couple of these charts here. Okay, so here's the IBIT, okay? And what I'm gonna do very quickly here is I'm gonna take a quick screenshot, okay? And so this is the two hour chart of IBIT, all right? So what I've done here now is I just took a quick screenshot of that. And I just put that over here now. So now watch what happens if I then, let's say, go to the FBTC, okay? And now I bring this thing, the other thing back up that I just took a picture of, and I put them side by side, okay? <laughs> the chart is identical, okay? So there's no difference in trade. Okay, if you notice, there's FBTC, there's IBIT. Just look at the right side of the chart there and look at the right side of the chart there, okay? They're, they're literally identical because there are times that I'll say that two charts, they, they rhyme, they sort of look alike, but they're not identical. These are identical because they're all, they're tracking the exact same thing. They're all tracking the exit, you know, the, the price of Bitcoin today in the spot market. So there's no difference. So all of the things being equal, you may as well just trade the most liquid one. Um, because there's really going to be no difference trading IBIT, GBTC, whatever. So I would just stick to kind of trading, you know, trade trade the ones that are most highly liquid because you're going to get the best execution out of it. And if there's any and if there's anything about the bid ask spread, um, these are going to be the ones that are going to have the absolute minimum spread between the um, the bid and the ask. So you may as well just trade the most highly liquid ones. All right. So, so here's your universe of stocks. Okay. So all you can, well, all you have to do is, you know, and in fact, after we're done with this session, uh, I'll drop this list. Um, we'll send it out via email and we'll put it also into our, uh, into our communication portal in Slack for all of our subscribers. We'll throw it into a spreadsheet. Okay. But these are all, these are your symbols. So all you have to do is once you get the spreadsheet from us is just copy and paste the symbol list like this, 
you'll just get it and then just copy it into your uh, your watch list and then just cut and paste it and you just drop it in like that and then you'll have you'll have the list okay so uh again we'll give you the uh, so we'll, we'll furnish everybody with the uh, the list there all right so that's the story so that's what to trade okay so now the question of course is how do you trade it all right so we trade uh we subscribe to this whole concept of supply and demand here okay so what i'm going to do here is i'm just going to bring up a couple of charts here and i'll just kind of show you in another and i'm actually going to show also the fact that we can trade whether it's bitcoin or anything else uh we can trade um the various different time frames and what by that i mean in different styles so what i mean is we can we can do what's referred to as short term swing trading and that's um basically getting into a trade let's say on a monday and you know maybe you hold it throughout you know through the week maybe you only hold it for a day or two or three so you get on on monday and you get out anywhere from let's say tuesday to friday um that's short term swing trading essentially holding it from anywhere from let's you know you're definitely holding it overnight okay but then you're holding it from anywhere let's say from 1 to 4 or 5 days that's short term swing trading then you have what's referred to as longer term swing trading and so longer term swing trading of course would be let's say anything over 5 days and that's essentially you know you're going to be holding it for you know a week or two or three or four um and so that's that's kind of longer term swing trading and then going backwards in terms of shorter term stuff then you have what what's what we refer to as intraday trading which used to be called day trading except people sort of it, it kind of got the, the the connotation of cowboys so they 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 so, somehow thought that intraday uh sounds a little more reasonable than day trading i don't know why but that's that's the that's the the terminology that's been adopted all right so so intraday trading is of course then the concept of you know you get in at 10 a.m and you're out by you know you know if you're, if you're trading in the east uh the market of course closes at four and so you're out by the end of the day okay and that's intraday and then of course within intraday then you can have really kind of really short-term swing trading and that's referred to as scalping and generally you know you kind of like you know a lot of times you're in for you know a few minutes or even here and there or you could be in for a, in a trade for a minute um so that's the whole concept of of uh you know various flavors of 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 swing trading okay so um i'm going to show you actually an example of each one of those all right so i'm going to start out and then and that will also kind of illustrate the whole concept of uh, of this supply and demand concept that we utilize to actually get into uh, a trade and what we what we're looking for in terms of a setup okay so here is the longer term thing that i was just talking about here so this is a chart of general uh general motors okay and this is a weekly chart okay so when we meet when we talk about a weekly chart each one of these bars represents one full week of trading so this is a higher time frame chart and we're actually looking at institutional levels here okay and so we can see clearly right here price dropped here over the course of about two or three weeks and then for the better part of three let's say two or three three or four weeks here it kind of consolidated and created this base here and then over the period of let's say a couple of months here you know if it, like three or four months two or three three or four months it just kind of you know kind of, you know with this one little pullback but other than that it kind of made this kind of you know kind of rather you know rather elongated move here okay and so that right here in this in this region right here and let me just blow this up a little here okay in this region right here this is where um buyers and sellers were in agreement within this within this range of about $2 and let's say $3 $3 $3 range here okay from about 23 to about 26 and change here okay so this created what's referred to as a base okay it's an area of consolidation and so within that um essentially willing buyers and willing sellers were kind of shuffling shares back and forth within this within this relatively narrow range of a consistent range over the period of this few weeks okay and then all of a sudden something happened here 
And all of a sudden, there was nobody was willing to sell here anymore. And the reason we know no one was willing to sell in here anymore is because these trades occurred. Okay. And so essentially what happened was uh, there was an exhaustion of sellers. There were no more sellers left here. And so as a result, the buyers had to run up the price chart until they encountered willing sellers at higher prices. Okay. So within this region right here, we can think of uh, willing buyers as the demand for shares within here. Okay. And then we can think of willing sellers as the supply of shares that are in this region. So right in here, okay, okay, willing sellers representing supply, willing buyers willing representing demand, supply and demand were in balance here. They were balanced because, they, because we can see that there was essentially price was being going back and forth in this narrow range. But then right here, when price kind of rockets out of here, Okay, this reflects that there are no more willing sellers, only willing buyers. And so what happened was willing buyers had to run up the price chart until they encountered willing sellers. Okay, well, at that point, then there was no there was no more supply at this at this region anymore, only demand. Okay, and as a result, we refer to this once this occurs, we refer to this region here as a demand zone. Because right here, there was there was only demand that was left once price left here. Okay, so that's a, that's a demand zone here. Okay, and in fact, if I could show you this right here, here is a little summary of what I just went through here. Okay, so right here, this is what what I was just referring to here as a demand zone here. Okay, okay, we start out with a clear abrupt exhaustion of sellers in a range. Okay, followed by an energetic bullish move. Okay, and then as the buyers ran up the price chart to find willing sellers at higher prices. Okay, so that's what that is. Okay, and then what we're waiting for when is we're waiting for price to re, for the price of this of General Motors to return to this level. In other words, to pull back here, back to this level, and then when it when it did return back to that level we would then actually then trigger a bullish trade. And then there's various ways one could actually again get into a trade at that level, okay? And so this is that the concept of expressing a trade. So we could either buy a stock, buy a call, which is of course an, a, a bullish option position, okay? And then there's a couple of others, you know, kind of spread trades, which we won't talk about now, okay? But essentially this is what we would, you could either buy the stock or the ETF or buy or buy a call, okay? So that's what we're looking for at when we when we kind of look at this when we when we look at this thing here. Okay. So now if we flash forward, okay, this is where we were at the time that I mapped this out. And this was October 30th. So this is the day before Halloween at the at near the end of last year. Okay. And so when when the price we returned here, and that was right on the doorstep here, okay, we were going to get into the trade, okay. At 2760 to 2672, you can see we were at 2736 at that time. And of course, we could extrapolate this to doing this with, we could do this with, it, with an ETF of Bitcoin, of course. Okay. So the, the IBIT that we were just looking at, or BITO, or G, you know, the, you know, any of the ones that we were just looking at, uh, we could just as easily be doing this with a Bitcoin ETF. Okay. So now if we flash forward here, Okay. Eventually, what happened was um, about a month later, we had because uh, I remember I showed you that I was looking at this around October 30th. And so basically one month later, okay, it actually got back, okay, to got back to this thing here. Okay. And so we actually got into the trade. Excuse me, actually, we it got back to this thing about two weeks later on October t on, on November 10th. That was our entry point here. OK, and we ended up executing the trade with an option to get into twenty six, twenty five. OK, and then about three or four weeks passed. And then we ended up getting out of the trade actually at the beginning of this year. OK, so this thing actually this trade actually ran for about three months and we ended up getting out of the trade 
uh, at the end of January here. So you can see this thing was about, uh, this trade actually went for about two and a half months because we got in at mid-November and we got out at the end of January, okay? And actually that's a typo there. That should of course say 2024, um, but there you go. So at any rate, that was, so that was that trade Okay, that got that that we got in on this very very long term um, long term scenario. Okay, so that was a long term swing trade with General Motors, and of course we could do that just as easily with a Bitcoin. Okay, then similarly, um, if, and also if we look right here, what we did was we we basically this was a two to one trade. Okay, we ended up capturing. Okay, because we basically if you if you traded the stock. Okay, you would have had just a little, little more than three dollars worth of risk, and we actually picked up about six, a little more than six dollars on the on the uh, on the gain. Okay, so that was a two to one trade. Okay, okay, so that's what that that's what that looked like here uh, for um, General Motors. Okay, so now if we move back to let's say a shorter term uh, time frame, um, we could then look at. Um, this right here. Let me bring up another uh, set of slides here. Okay, so then now this is kind of a, a shorter term uh, trade, and this is one I think that only went on. And I'll show you. I'll show you what transpired here. So this was an ETF of uh, the consumer. Uh, what is this? Consumer staples, I think. XLP. Okay, and so right here, and this was where I showed you before on General Motors, that was a bullish trade. Uh, this is going to, this was a setup for a bearish trade, okay? So we're essentially waiting for the price to get up to one of these two levels, okay? And then in order to either short the stock or to buy a put option, okay? And so if we go back to the, uh, the thing that I was just showing you here, okay? This is an area of supply, okay? And so before what I showed you on General Motors, I showed you an exhaustion of sellers, okay? Right here, this is an exhaustion of buyers, okay? Price, okay, so now we're looking at a two hour chart versus a weekly chart. So let's say up here, price came up, consolidated, kind of rolled over here, created kind of a pivot up here, and then created this base. And then notice it kind of then drops out with a great deal of energy. Okay, and then there's a pause, and then notice that then that then that that thump down over the period of a few days here. Okay, so there was an initial energetic move out, a pause, and then another kind of then a, and then a major thump out of here. So the point was right here, we were going to either wait for the price to return to this level, or or wait for it to get to this level. And I believe at the time, and I'll show you what actually transpired there, we ended up waiting for this level because I think the market all of a sudden kind of ignited and got very strong. And so we didn't want to get in here because of the fact that we thought that this level might not hold because the market all of a sudden kind of caught on fire. And so we'll, here we'll actually take a look now at, the, um, at what transpired here. So let me go to the live chart here. And here is XLP, okay? So here is that level that we were just looking at, okay? Here was that other orange level that I said we were, you know, I think at the time we were, we were a little skittish about, okay? So right here though, okay? And that was right there, we, we were looking at that very, very strong move. And that's why we kind of didn't want to get into this trade at that point, okay? And so when it got up to this level, Okay, so this was in December here. Okay, price came up here. Okay, we ended up again. We, we what we ended up doing was buying a put option. Okay, but again, you could have just as easily shorted the XLP. You didn't have to use options. Okay, and so we got in here though at uh, on on the December thirteenth, and we got out basically a week later on the twentieth. Okay, so we bought an option here. We bought a put option with the expectation that price was going to go down. And it just so happened that it worked out very nicely for us. Uh, it came up, kind of kissed this level, and then kind of dropped out of here uh, over the period of about a week here. Okay. And so we bought this option at 170. Okay. We ended up uh, closing the closing the uh, the option trade at three bucks. Okay. So we picked up $1.30. So based on $1.30, 
um, excuse me, ba based on the initial premium of a dollar seventy, we got out at one with with a, with a one thirty profit at three bucks, which would mean, of course, that that represents a gain of about seventy five, seventy six percent using the options. So that was that was obviously a, a sweet trade, okay. And again, one could just as easily have done that uh, with um, uh, using Bitcoin. Okay, so I'm going to show you now some uh, some 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 of the charts uh, with 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 actually looking at uh, Bitcoin now, and you'll see kind of the same kind of patterns uh, that we were just looking at. Except we'll now we'll, we'll show that we'll show them in Bitcoin. Okay, so the one thing about Bitcoin charts, you, you, which you may notice here. Um, and then, and that, and it doesn't make a difference whether it's a two-hour chart or a daily chart. But you'll notice here. In fact, let me show you the daily chart just for a second here. You'll notice something about Bitcoin. The charts tend to be very, very gappy. Okay, unlike unlike like most or at least a lot of stocks. Notice how gappy these these charts are, and particularly over the last though, let's say the last month or so. Uh, you know. Bitcoin is kind of obviously uh, it's been on fire um, basically ever since uh, or, or I should say shortly after uh, the um, after the the ETFs got introduced. They kind of dumped in the beginning of when they when they were introduced. But lately, though, for the last, let's say, 45 days or so, uh, Bitcoin is obviously rocketed from. So on this one ETF, let's say it's gone from about 34 you can see it went. It basically went up to 65. That's close to doubling. 68, of course, would have been a double. Okay, so um, you'll notice that these 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 charts tend to be very very gappy. There's almost almost on every day uh, there's there's a little gap in there, which which of course greatly differs from uh, from from an individual stock. Okay, so if we go back now to the to the two hour chart, which was the basis of some trades that we had here, though. So right here, um, if we look right down here, okay, notice right here, price comes up here. So this was uh, around, actually, we're more or less around the same time as that other, that other, uh, uh, that XLP chart. It was actually the same exact time frame, coincidentally. That's December thirteenth at the end of last year. Okay, so price came up, rallied. Notice then price rocketed out of there, okay, with a great deal of energy, and then. Price came right back here, and we ended up getting this trade from from running from right here to right there. And again, just to be clear, we're not trading the initial move out of the level. What we're waiting to do is we're waiting for price to return to the level, and then that's the trigger for our trade. Okay, and so that that we can show that right here. Okay, so right here. That here's the, the the pattern that we were just looking at. Okay, this is the long setup. We refer to that as a rally, a base, and a rally here. That's for the RBRs here. And again, so right here, price rallies, consolidates, and then rallies again. Okay, so that's what we're that's what we're looking at right here. Okay, rally, base, rally, price. That there's that second rally, and then we're waiting for a return or a retracement back to this level. And then that is what your trade trigger is. So again, we're not trading that move, but we're waiting for a pullback to here in order to then get into this trade when when, when essentially what we do is we when the level gets tested, okay? Because the thought is once price leaves the level, okay, if it hasn't been in there for a long time, that there is still um, buying pressure that's waiting to be tapped. And so that's what we're waiting for when price returns to this level. So that's the uh, the foundation for our trade. Okay. And then similarly, when I showed you that uh, that XLP chart, it was the same exact thing. Okay. Where except that right here we had the exhaustion of buyers here, but it's the same exact thing again. Here we, we are, there's the expectation of downward price pressure that's waiting to be uh, tapped by a retracement or a return back to that that supply zone there. And then that's where we're getting into it to the trade. So that's where our trade trigger is. So this is the setup. That's the trigger. Okay. So that's what we're looking at here. So here, here is again. So here again, a drop. We had a rally, a base, and a rally there. Price returned to this region, 
Okay, and then we ended up getting in, into this this trade here. So we kind of rode that from thirty three sixty to about thirty six forty four. So that's about a three dollar move that we caught from there. Okay, so that was that was that trade. And then then a short while later, uh, there was another setup that got created uh, right at the uh, the end of last year and the begin or the beginning of this year. This was like right around New Year's Eve or so. Price came down here. Notice that major gap there. That's indicative of a uh, of, of of a of a great of a of a major exhaustion of sellers. Okay, so price came back. Actually, it kissed this front level, but we didn't get into the trade at that point. Um, I don't recall why we didn't get in at that point, but you can see it. Price came back and rocketed from from there. So the thing is, though, when 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 price returned here again. Um, because of the fact that it had barely touched this level, we thought that that this level was still kind of still had a, a lot of oomph, a lot of juice left in it, even because of the fact that it only kind of just kissed this level the first time. So as a result, when price returned here, OK, this was another trade right there. And so we got in there and then where we got out of the trade was right there. OK, because of the fact that this was an, an area of supply that it formed in front of this region here, okay? And so you can see, obviously, we, you know, we got in at 34.60, uh, we got out at, let's say, 30, 38 or so, that's about a three, $3.50 move. Um, so that's about a 10% move, obviously, based on a 34, $35 stock, okay? So that was about a 10% move on the um, on the uh, the stock. And of course, using options, uh, the, the rate of return, of course, was far greater. Because of the fact we actually some of some some of our subscribers uh, we bought calls based on this, okay. So that's that. So that's the that that's the um, that that's the the foundation uh, for these for for a, for for a couple of Bitcoin trades that we had um, based on these charts here. Also, just to let you know, um, I once 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 a level though is basically is 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 used generally we don't go back to it again like i said this was an exception only because we if you look really closely you can see let me see here in fact it actually didn't even it, it actually missed the level actually by a couple of pennies but even if it had gone into this let's say briefly we would have been fine taking this trade a second for, with a second return to this level but now that the now the price kind of drilled into here like this, let me just blow this up here a little. Okay, now that this kind of drill, drilled in here a fair amount, we're done with this level. So we would not go back to the well again. So if there was a major pullback here, and of course now that we're up at around 65, I don't expect to see this unless unless Bitcoin just totally collapses again, which it's been known to do. Obviously we could see right there, that's a major collapse there. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, but if it did return to this level, we wouldn't take a trade at this level again, in case because of the fact that th that the demand here has been chewed up. Okay, so so now if we were looking and con contemplating, okay, well, where that where might there be another trade on Bitcoin? Um, we 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 might actually be looking, let's say, right here. This would probably represent. potential now of course that's a that's a long way away okay so the so you know what we're going to do is we, we 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 would wait to see because of the fact that this thing has been moving so quickly um there really aren't any quality levels on this okay the only potential levels here are kind of maybe like right here and then also maybe this this region right here okay but this is really just a this is really just a, a gap. This is really just a one day of trading, and there's a gap above and a gap below. So I I really wouldn't even be looking to trade this. Okay, so there's really nothing here on the um, on the daily chart or, or even the two hour chart of Bitcoin here. So what we need to do is we need to basically see a, a, re, a we need to kind of see a pullback here, and then need to see a, a bit of consolidation here, and then that'll end up sort of creating some zones for us, and then we'll end up getting some more uh, more trades on Bitcoin. But at the moment, there's really nothing here, and that's also a good lesson, because 
not every chart has a setup. So at PTL, we always aim to be picky. So if we if we don't find an A setup, uh, we just move on and just go to another symbol or another another trading theme. We're not we, so we're not so we actually haven't had any uh, any trades on Bitcoin uh, for, for 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 a few days because we're waiting for price to return and kind of create some more levels here. And then we'll end up doing that. All right. So that's kind of a medium. So what we, what I just showed you now um, was a couple couple of medium term swing trades. Those were like two, three, four, five days. Okay. The last thing I'm going to show you here um, is I'm also going to show you um, how this supply and demand concept um, can be used on an intraday basis. And again, I'm going to show you something some some stock, but it could just as easily be used. Uh, for Bitcoin, okay. So here is our um, um, our uh, communication portal that we use for our subscribers here. And so right here, this was something that I had actually posted on our intraday channel um, uh, yesterday. Okay. So right here, uh, this was a uh, oops. Excuse me, right there. There we go. So right here, here was. And, and again, now we're looking at a five minute chart. So I've shown you a weekly chart. I've shown you daily charts. I've shown you two hour charts. And now we're looking at a five minute chart. So of course, this is this was something that we utilized for an intraday trade. Okay, so now we're looking at the uh, at a lower time frame, short duration trade. And again, this could be just as easily used for uh, for Bitcoin. Okay, so right here again, we have this is where price had closed the previous day at around five dollars and fifty cents, and basically you can see the whole whole day more or less, or at least the, during that afternoon, it was just kind of languishing around five fifty. But then the next day, it gapped up to about five seventy five, and it kind of got up to about six bucks. And then notice right here, all of a sudden there was this rocket out of there. Okay, so something happened. And so there was some change of perception. That change of perception led to an exhaustion of sellers. Again, again, right here, so the supply, the willing buyers and willing sellers were kind of in agreement within this, let's say, 20 or 25 minute period here, because we have five, uh, five candles here. And then right here, all of a sudden, there was an exhaustion of sellers. No one was willing to sell here anymore. And so again, if sellers leave the region, which of course we refer to, we think of sellers as demand. Okay, well that means that all that was left was, excuse me, sellers leaving that supply. That means that all that was left here was demand. Consequently, this is a lower time frame, five minute demand zone. Okay, so when price then goes out of here, we were then waiting for 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 this thing BMR to return to this region, and then that would be the foundation for a long trade to get in here. And this is where our stop incidentally would be because what we do is we set up a zone and then we put our stop a short distance behind at the behind the back line of this of this demand zone okay so that was the initial thought about to get into a trade based on this okay so now if we flash forward here's what we were just looking at so price rocketed out of there kind of consolidated and then just kind of kept going again. So if you notice, we're just getting further and further away from this zone. Okay. So this zone is kind of like now fading into the rear view mirror here because it's getting further and further away. Okay. So, but right here, okay. We actually noticed that right here, again, there was a consolidation here. One of the things that we're looking for is what the structure here looks like. Um, you know, in other words, how big some of these candles are, how big some of these wicks are. Um, I'm not going to go into all the heavy duty detail. Now we kind of go into that um, in our, uh, you know, obviously with our subscribers. But then when price, when, 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 so when price uh, rocketed out of here again, though, this became another demand zone. So this was a higher demand zone than here. Okay. So this became now a, a kind of a, another, you know, an, another waiting for a pullback into this region in order to then get long out of here. Okay. And this is one of the things that we do for intraday trading. Sometimes what you have to do is we, I refer to it as stalking the symbol. Okay. So in other words, you create a zone and then price goes out of it. And then you may find that you have to then 
create another one or two zones on top because price the price is just kind of going away from you. Okay. Now you may say to yourself, well, wait a minute. Why don't you just trade that? Why don't you just trade this up move here? Well, this just did. It, it, it's very clear in the rear view mirror that it, there was this up move. I had no idea that this up move was going to happen. Okay. I knew that this had happened here, but I had no idea that this was going to happen. So if you say, well, why didn't I, you know, why didn't, why don't you just trade that? Well, I didn't know this was going to happen. Okay. The thing is, though, once this does happen, okay, it leaves a demand zone in its wake. And then this is, again, an area of, of potential um, upward price pressure that's waiting to be tapped. So what we're looking for are the footprints of price action that suggests that there is upward price pressure that's still waiting to be tapped over here. Okay, so that now became another demand zone. Okay, and so right here, again, similarly the same way we had this demand zone here. Okay, here's the same structure here. Here's our entry, here's our stop out. Okay, the stop out was a nickel below the um, a nickel, nickel below the, uh, the the back line of this demand zone, and so this became then the uh, the foundation for if we got the if we got a pullback into this region, we were going to get long at six sixty five. Okay, so that's the setup. Okay, so if we now flash forward, here's what we were just looking at, and. Um, so the, we were looking at this. This level was around 11:10 a.m. or or so. That's when the the, the right side of that that level is around 11:10, and then this is around 10:50 or so. So this is a you know about uh, about 20 minutes worth of trading here. That was the basis of this demand zone. And then you could see uh, about 40 or 45 minutes later, price pulled back to this region. Okay, and then over the course of about an hour. Um, we then ended up getting this really, really nice move out of here. And so we ended up getting out right there. Okay. So what we're looking at here, this was actually a three to one trade. Okay. So, and I described that before when we were looking at one of the other charts, but this is a three to one trade because what we were doing is we had 25 cents of risk from 640 to 665. So that's 25 cents. So, which means that if you were trading a hundred shares, you'd be risking 25 bucks. If you were trading 400 shares, you'd be risking 100 bucks. Okay, so that's how that works, 400 times a quarter, right? So that's that's how much risk you have. So if you were trading f trading 400 and you were risking 100 bucks, well, there's a 25 cent move. That's a one-to-one -one trade. There's a, there's a 50 cent move. That's a two-to-one trade. And then there's a, then the, and of course, there's a, um, a 75 cent move. And that's a three to one trade. Okay. So we ended up getting three to one on this. Okay. So that was the basis for the, uh, the trade on BMR. And again, um, what you do is you, um, you're basically waiting for price to return uh, to the scene of the crime, the, 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 the setup, which is the demand zone here. And then again, once, and once it tests that demand zone, with it, that's that that is the trigger for our trade, and then that's how we get into the trade, and then how it then then it goes from there. So that was actually a real sweet trade. And then let me, let me show you though though uh, it's not all um, it's not all wine and roses. Uh, there are times that of course these these levels of uh, they will fail, and we're we're when we're fully prepared for that as well. Okay, so right here, uh, let's see here. So at the same time we had we had created a setup. Let's see right here. So right here, this kind of looks a little somewhat similar to what I just showed you before. So here's a different symbol, the ERI. Okay. So price rallied here, consolidated. Notice then price rocketed out of there. And so this was this represented a um, what we thought was a quality setup here. And so when price returned here, okay, we got into the trade right here. And there was the expectation that we would then end up, you know, uh, bringing the cash register and this would be a nice trade. OK, but alas, that's not what had happened. Yeah. So price returned to this region. And I think I changed the time frame here. This was yeah, this was a five minute chart here. I had changed the view on it to a three minute chart. But, you know, the, the, the level is the level here. So that's why this just looks a little different here. Uh, but you can see price returned here. 
and it just started to bounce, but it just never really got off the ground. And then we ended up getting stopped out right there. Okay. And so that's, that's, that was, that was the story. So we, we just got stopped out and there it is. So the point being is that um, win or lose, we have these supply and demand zones. We know where our stop outs are and we we'll, we know where, our, and we know where our profits are. So what we're doing is when we get into these trades, we're looking to, to nail two and three to one on them based on the structure of the pr- of the price action. And when it doesn't work, then we take what we what we think of as a paper cut. We take a small loss and then we just move on from that. So we don't do anything that's either you know really damaging to our account size, uh, nor damaging to our psyche. And the one the one key to this whole methodology is like any other methodology is once you set a stop, you actually have to have the discipline to follow it. And uh, we and our subscribers do that. Okay, so um, that's how uh, that's how that worked. Um, for, for this. So unlike a lot of people that deal with trading and talk about their trading, uh, we don't claim that we're right 87 or 97% of the time. Uh, we're not that arrogant. Okay, We're going to be wrong. And so when we're wrong, we take a small loss and we, we take a small manageable planned on loss and then we just move on. Because if you're a superstar, you're going to be right 50, let's say 50 or 60 percent of the time, and you're getting two, two and three to one on your trades. You're a superstar at that point, but that means that you're wrong 30 or 40 percent of the time. Well, you have to be willing to be wrong that 40 percent of the time and take a one unit loss. And so that's what we do, and that's how you know these these supply and demand zones allow us to do that. Okay, so so again, going full circle here, um, these supply and demand zones. Um, can be traded in either you know longer term swing trades, shorter term swing trades of let's say of, of a few days. Uh, can they also be tra- they could also be traded on an intraday basis. And then, like I said, when we kind of started all started all this off, um, these can be used for any any sort of instrument. Uh, they can be used for futures. They can be used for stocks. They can be used for ETFs. And in the case of what the subject uh, the subject is of what we what we let off with is uh, we you can of course use this to trade spot Bitcoin, um, and that's that's actually kind of exciting because again this is this is essentially. Um, for people that are only trading in the equity markets, um, that 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 has been an opportunity that it, that did not exist until uh, I guess the, the the earlier this year or what or or a short time ago. In fact, if I look at the IBIT, you can you'll actually be able to see. I think it's IBIT. You can actually see when it came into uh, it came into existence, and that would be right here. Okay. This, this chart does not go any further to the left here, okay? So that's, what is that, January 11th, okay? So we're now at March 14th. So this is literally basically two months, okay? So this is about 44, tra- well, this is about 42 or 44 trading days uh, once you factor in holidays. So that's, that's, that's what we're looking at here. So again, um, so one of the things we'll be doing is, uh, with, particularly with our subscribers, is we will uh, we'll, we'll be starting to post, um, you know, you know, major, you know, good good setups um, with uh, with with the spot Bitcoin. And the other thing is all that that's also exciting is for a number of these ETFs, uh, we can also uh, utilize options. Okay. So, you know, so, um, you know, if you may, you may, you may, you may catch a three or a 5% move trading the ETF, but if you trade a call or a put, uh, you'll see that it'll, it'll be very possible to, you know, nail rates of return of, you know, 25, 30, 40% in the, in the space of, you know, a, a small number of days. And that's obviously very exciting. So, um, so that's the story. So we could trade uh, we can trade spot Bitcoin and we could trade it essentially in all three time frames. So there you go. How's that? Good stuff. It's gonna be fun to play with these a little <laughs> bit as they as they expand and there's more to it, you know, compared to like getting the wallet and all that kind of stuff. I know it's easier now, but still like I've heard so many horror stories. So it'll be interesting as there's more time and like the daily charts start to fill in as like we go on through the summer and so on. It's going to be should be good, some good trading. So um, 
I don't know if there are any uh, anybody post any questions here or any. Let any... me check. Guys, if you have questions you want to throw it in the chat, happy to answer it. And if not, we will round the bases and call it a day. How do you know when not to? Uh, how do you know when not? to option ver uh do you mean day versus swing or do you mean like when not to use options rich i think you just type up the question was how do you know when not to use options versus swing oh yeah. okay all right okay first probably versus stock type up Oh, versus stock okay got it, got it. okay good good, 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 good right. question yeah um all right so let me take a quick look here and let me, I'm going to bring up, I'm going to take like just two minutes here. Let me bring up the option chain here and we can kind of do a little analysis here. And let me just see if what we got here. And the, and the, and the, the, the short answer is what we want to do is we want to analyze and take a look at the options and see how liquid the options are. And, you know, so we see like what the, what are the bid ask spreads look like? And then we'll also see what, you know, see what the liquidity on them is. And then you also analyze them from the perspective of risk and reward. And then you kind of make a decision. So for instance, uh, let's see, IBIT. So that's that really liquid, um, that's that really liquid uh, ETF. So I don't even know if there are options for it. Let's see, let me see if they've introduced options on this yet. Because I know that like, like BITO, B-I-T-O has it. Let me see if there are options on these yet. Nope. Okay. So there's no options on IBIT. Let me, so let me see here. So that, that's one way of not trading the options when they don't, when there are no options. Um, but let's see, GBTC, GBTC, because it's quite possible that maybe these spot ones, yes, yeah, these spot ones don't seem to have options yet, but I would, I would anticipate that they're going to have them eventually. On the other hand, I know BITO, which is the Bitcoin strategy one. That one does have options. Okay, so now what we're doing, so now what we're doing is we're looking at BITO. So this is the ProShares Bitcoin strategy ETF. And this has been around for a long time. Okay, so what you would do is you wanna look at you know, let's just say, you know, if you were decide, you know, you were going to decide, let's say, to get into a, uh, maybe, let's say, you were going to wait for a pullback into a demand zone in order to then execute a bullish trade out of that demand zone. So you want to express a bullish trade out of a demand zone. Okay, so we've talked about the general guidelines of what we want to do is we want to generally have really 90 days or more of time in the option. So that we don't get beaten up by time decay. Okay. Again, you're not going to be in the trade for 90 days. You may not be in the trade for two weeks or even a week. But the point is you want to build in the contingency so that if you do get stuck in the trade because the tr the because the um, the instrument doesn't really react, okay. But but let's just say it kind of this sort of putters along and it kind of flatlines on you. Okay, you're not going to get beaten up by time decay. So if you're going to get into a trade today with BITO, let's just say you happen to be getting into a demand zone, you really would want to get into it either by using the, um, let's say the June 21st um, expiration ETF, because that's got 98 calendar days to go till expiration. That's what that 98D means. And again, I, you know, as I always tell people, um, unlike everything else with trading, options are measured in terms of time they're based on calendar days not trading days so when we talk about 98 d here it's literally 98 days until we get to june 21st okay in other words right here it might be let's say 68 trading days or something like that but it's 98 calendar days okay so what we do is we look at this and now there's now we're looking at the June 21st. And let's just say we were gonna let's just say we happen to have a demand zone right where we are now at 3250. Okay. We would take a look at 32, let's say the nearest option at 32, and you could see. Okay, so you can see that you know there's really no open interest 
on the 32s. On the other hand, on the 30, excuse me, on the 30, 32s, yeah, there's no open interest on the 32s. On the other hand, the 31s have a tremendous amount of open interest. It's 1,300, okay? So what you want to do more often than not is if you're going to get into a trade, what you want to do is utilize the trades that have um, some, you know, some, some, some decent open interest because that'll generally suggest that you're going to have a relatively narrow bid-ask spread. Okay. Now, one thing you should notice here, though, if you notice right here, the bid-ask spread is really wide here. That's, that's a function that the fact that the market is now closed. Okay, this is not these and these numbers are not real here, um, and so as a result, on on some of these, so d don't concern yourself by going oh because that that looks like a really wide bid ask spread. It's just because of the fact that the market isn't closed and there's there's really no data here. Um, but like tomorrow morning, this you know this and if you can see on some of these, it's relatively narrow here though. Uh, where did I just actually no I, yeah yeah they're all just kind of. They're, they're all kind of wide here. And that's just because the market is closed there. So what you want to do is um, you want to make sure that you know, when you get into a trade, A, of course, buy enough time. And then B, generally trade something that has a reasonable amount of, of volume and open interest. Okay. So that's one thing. And then once you get into the trade, and we're not going to go into this now, but one of the things that you're going to do is once you do that, and let's just say you happen to select an option. Okay. What you're going to do then is you're going to plot various prices here, and then you're going to actually then utilize your options platform in order to then kind of assess the risk and reward proposition. So in other words, you may say, well, I'm going to get into the trade. The option is going to cost me five bucks. If it hits my stop out point, well, then the value of the option is going to go down to, let's say, 450. So I would lose 50 cents. On the on the a premium, which would mean, of course, I would lose fifty bucks on the contract. Okay, so what you want to do though is say, okay, if I hit my target, what's going to be my my reward if I'm sort of risking, let's say, fifty cents or something? And you want to make sure that that hitting your target is going to yield, let's say, at least a buck, so that you at least have a, a decent shot at getting two to one. Okay, so. You know that's kind of the that that's kind of the the, the general approach that you want to make sure that the a if you're trading a good chart of the underlying and then b you're trading a liquid option and then c you want to make sure that once you do your options analysis that you're going to see that you're going to get sufficient and appropriate risk and reward so that essentially you can kind of hold to your trading plan of trying to get to, you know, you know, overall getting at least two to one on every trade. Obviously, you're going to have losing trades and you're going to have trades that work and you're not going to get two to one. But then there are going to be any number of other trades where you are going to get two, three and four to one. And of course, it all, you know, obviously what the way it works is, of course, you net everything out. And what you want to do is you want to be averaging two to one, let's say at least two to one. So that's how that, so that, I hope that answers that question. It's kind of that three-pronged approach. You know, A, have a good underlying chart, B, trading a liquid option, and then C, once you've selected the option, uh, do your options analysis, and then make sure that uh, the risk and reward proposition uh, is going to work out for you. So hope that's a, uh, at least a good initial answer to that. It's a good question, Rich. I like how you're thinking. So there you and go. Mitch, I think I think that will do it for today. Well, there you go. All righty. So um, people are asked, uh, yes, there will be, uh, you know, the, the, the recording of this. Uh, there will be a link for this. And so uh, tomorrow you'll be able to grab it and uh, we take, a, take a review on it if you want. And uh, there you go. Cool. Until next time, folks, I will uh, see you uh, next week. Mitch, thanks for doing that. Appreciate sure. introducing this kind of demystifying uh, the, a safer way, a safer alternative. So um, good stuff. And we will see you guys next time. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.